listening to Syntax, the podcast with the tastiest web development treats out there. Strap yourself in and get ready. Here is Scott Talensky and Wes Boss. Welcome to Syntax, the podcast with the tastiest potluck ever. Today, we've got another potluck for you. This is one of our last episodes that Scott and I are pre-recording for the summer, and then we're going to go drink margaritas by the beach for the rest of the summer and just relax a little bit. Today, we've got three awesome sponsors. We've got Linode, Cloud Computing and Cloud Hosting, Sentry, Air Exception and Performance Monitoring, and a brand new sponsor today, Auth0, which I have to tell myself to say because I always always say Auth0 for some reason. Yo, me too. Yeah, same. It's clearly a zero. Very clearly a zero. Because of OAuth, yeah. Auth just sounds so cool. Anyways, yeah. Auth0 handles authentication and authorization in your application, so you don't have to. We'll talk about all of those sponsors partway through the episode. How are you doing today, Mr. Talinsky? Hey, I'm doing good. I actually just got back from the beach, which was great. We took a little mini vacation, almost like a second honeymoon type of deal. This is the first time being away from the kids, and um, we were like gone for, for like... Yeah, they gone for like five days. We didn't know how the kids would do, right? We've never left them with the grandparents before. Yeah. And, um, you know, they know their grandparents and they love their grandparents. But still, we never left them for an extended period of time or even like a day. <laughs> and uh, it was like the third day of our vacation. And Courtney's dad was like, Court, I don't know how to tell you this, but the kids, they haven't really cared that you left. <laughs> and we were just <laughs> like, oh, man, <laughs> that's not what we were expecting at all. But. Uh, feeling really good about that. At least, you know, you, I was so worried about the kids. So like to be able to hear that they were very comfortable with grandma and grandpa, you know, hanging for the week and whatever, that made me feel a lot more relaxed on the vacay. So yeah, I'm ready to go. And next thing is up a big move. We're moving to the level up lodge and new house, new studio. So a lot of changes here. By the time you, you check back in with syntax here, we'll be on a, this will be the last episode ever recorded in my current house. So it feels very weird. Oh, it's a little sad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I love this office. Yeah, yeah, it was a good one. A lot of uh a lot of code was written and a lot of words were spoken in that little blue office. Little is the right word. Wicked. Yeah, new one's gonna be great. Gonna get new styles, new furniture, new all that stuff. Cool. So let's get into the potluck here. We have a bunch of great questions. I was like having a hard time even stopping with the questions. So the first question is from Marciano S R. What are the use cases for SAS and SCSS in 2021, would you choose it over CSS or something else in a new project? So I use SAS in our level up tutorial site on Svelte Kit, even though we just started that project. And that was a conscious choice because really SAS is probably the lowest effort to get things like nesting ready to go. Now, there's a lot of different angles you could take to this. You could say post CSS will, can just do it all between post CSS and just regular CSS in 2021, you're probably covered. And I, I've tried to get on board with the the, the native nesting syntax. Wes, have you used it at all? No, I uh, we did a show on it, but it's not as nice as just the SAS and SCSS way. Yeah, that was the whole thing is I have the post CSS native nesting plugin in level up tutorials and SAS because Svelkit has post CSS. But I was having such a hard time converting our styled components and SAS code into the native nesting. And it required so much work. I was just like, screw it. I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm just going to use SCSS because that's what I already have. Yeah. So, So for me, that's the use case. You know, if we're talking CSS variables, I'm using CSS variables. 24-7 24-7 for just about everything with the exception of media queries. So this is a small thing. You cannot use CSS variables and media queries. So this is a small use case for SAS variables or SCSS variables. We we have our, our breakpoints all done in SCSS variables to make it easier across the board for us. Uh, that way we, we have them definitively typed out rather than having to uh, use the pixel values and things like that. But there's really not a ton of use cases, especially if you're rocking with post CSS. There's a lot there that you can do to even to mimic SCSS. But that said, we still use it just for the ease. Yeah, SAS is just like rock solid, you know, like it's oh, yeah. it's not going anywhere. It's everybody knows it. So if you need something like it's, I think it's still a good use case. And I think just don't go too heavy on like I, I know a lot of people went super heavy on Compass when it was still built in Ruby and all the custom SAS stuff. And I find like that kind of stuff is hard to refactor out of. 
But if you're just using for nesting and automatic BEM generation, that was another really handy use case for for SaaS. That kind of stuff is is pretty good. I, I wouldn't say SaaS is outdated or anything right now. It's just kind of, it's like, just like the the WordPress, I would say. And I say that in a nice way, meaning that like it's, it's old faithful. It's there. A lot of people know it and it's well-maintained, things like that. Yeah, it's a trusty workhorse. Next question we have here is from Kay Uger. What happened to CSS Houdini? It's true. We've been, it feels like we've been talking about Houdini on the podcast for a couple of years now. If you're not familiar, Houdini is a web API that is going to allow you to sort of write your own CSS, meaning that you get access, you can write CSS like display Scott, or you could pass a variable number of Scott's six in your CSS. And then you uh, write some it lo- like Canvas APIs. Um, they're called worklets. And you get access to the Paint API and the Layout API and Animation API and uh, a couple other, I think, fonts and a couple other pieces of, of CSS. And you'd be able to run JavaScript to generate and paint things in CSS. So it's, it's pretty exciting because once that's shipped, then we'll be able to, we'll start seeing like people write their own CSS, you know, they, they can ship it. So where is it at? Scott found this really nice website is Houdini ready yet.com. There is a lot of work to do just yet. I think that the reason behind that is because in order for Houdini to be shipped, there's a lot of like sort of under lower level stuff that needed to change in the browsers in order to implement it. But Chrome, Edge, Opera, Samsung has a lot of it shipped. Firefox, a lot of it is under consideration. Yeah, that's rough to see. Yeah, there's nothing in in Firefox that has been done yet. So like no, like no code written. Safari is partial support and in development, which is good. And then the spec, the spec is not even done yet. So like, I don't know. What do you think, Scott? When is it coming? Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't hold your breath. I was really hoping it was going to be sooner. Yeah. And it's great that you can play around with it in Chrome, but knowing that it's it's not a, even like in development in Firefox yet is pretty disheartening. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, no, this is not. But if the spec isn't done, I can see why. But still, yeah, I would really love it if um, if, if, if it came here, because this is one of those things that I personally like. It's right up my alley in terms of something that I would love to be able to do. I'd love to write my own custom CSS like that. But I guess we're we're just going to be waiting. And if you want to give this a try, you know, I guess just do it under the understanding that it's not going to be production ready anytime soon, considering Firefox is under consideration. So is Houdini ready yet is a great place to at least keep an eye on it. I would love an update maybe from the Firefox team as to like what the plan is there. Like where, where are, are they actually considering it or is that you know just like um is there any movement on it or is it just like kind of hanging out in limbo yeah i'm really glad to see that safari is <laughs> ahead yeah, of, of firefox there because usually that's the case it's like all right we're done this thing and safari's like wait what what wait what thing <laughs> what, what are you guys talking about yeah i bet firefox will come out swinging with it at some point, like it's, I can't imagine them being like, you know, what, we're not going to do this thing that's part of the spec. You know, that's that's uh, Firefox core. Yeah, I'm sure there's a very valid reason, but that's that I still want it. I agree. So we'll we'll keep you updated on it. Next question is from Serenity. Now, with all of this JS being transferred, have you ever tried to challenge yourself and build a project that doesn't allow any JavaScript in the front end alone, i.e. just HTML and CSS? I find it Funny how I can pretty much use Amazon.com with JS disabled. I literally cannot view the Angular docs if I disable it. Love the show. Thank you for answering. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I've written many, many sites without JavaScript. And it was when I was a a junior developer. Most of the sites I didn't have or wrote didn't use JavaScript at all, unless it was like a carousel. But like even then, you're going to need like a JavaScript for some interactive things, whether that is like, I know you can do this all with post requests or whatever, but it's a much better experience for your customer to use a little bit of JavaScript in that situation. Yeah, you can have it all working, but I still think no matter what, at the end of the day, you're probably going to want some JavaScript on your on your site. Now, there are tools that are coming out that are going to be making a lot of this stuff easier to ship less JavaScript. I find myself shipping way less JavaScript with SvelteKit 
But Astro.build is a new tool that is one of the things that is going to allow you to ship much less front end JavaScript code because it's sure you're writing JavaScript and the back end, but shipping less to the front end is always good. And I think these are the tools that, you, you know, you'll probably gravitate towards in, in modern development more so than just handwriting it all in HTML and CSS. Because the way I see JavaScript and shipping JavaScript should be a progressive enhancement, right? Sure, the site should and, and could be able to work without JavaScript on the front end. But many times the experience is much better if you're shipping that JavaScript and maybe it's being server-side rendered and then hydrated and that way the load times are faster, things like that. But in my mind, the tools are not going to be to write it all in just HTML and CSS and not use JavaScript at all, but more or less you're taking a, a tool like Gatsby or something that allows you to ship a static site HTML and then have it hydrated with JavaScript if needed, or even like these tools like Astro that are, are shipping way more without JavaScript. Yeah, yeah, I agree as well. Like it's, it, I'm not like a purist where you say no JavaScript at all. There's certainly those types of people, but your, your site should work without JavaScript, at least load so people can read the content on it and be able to click links and, and whatnot. But past that, sometimes JavaScript makes a much nicer experience. Not being able to view the Angular docs if you disable JavaScript seems a bit silly because they're probably just templating it all out on the uh, on the client side instead of either pre-rendering it or server rendering it. So that, that's probably why it, that should probably work, especially for load times or whatever. If you're on a plane, you need that stuff to work. Word. Uh, Next question we have here is from Noah. As we know, Tim Berners-Lee made the web. Apparently, after seeing everyone's data get harvested by tech companies, he decided to create a project called Solid at solidproject.org that allows people to own their data to control all permissions over it. So if a user logs into your app with Solid, rather than storing the info on their server, you store it in their Solid pod. Do you think you could... This could save web developers' conscience and disk space in the cloud. I like this idea because as a web developer, I don't want to be holding more data than I have to. Stripe does this already with credit cards where I don't hold any information about their credit card and stuff like that. That all gets held in Stripe. And if I need to be able to access it, you can just ping Stripe with the uh, a token. And that's great because... Like if someone can do the hard part of that and use the web developer can just use an API to access that. If it's easy to use and it's easy to integrate and it's not a pain in the butt, because if that's the case, then then people say, all right, well, screw this. We tried it, but we're going <laughs> to we're going to do it ourselves because it was not easy. So I had not heard of this before. I am pretty excited about it. Do you think we could get Tim Berners-Lee on the podcast? How cool would that be? Yeah, right. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I think anything that involves me not having to store more information is for the best. Not because I don't trust myself, but, you know, one loss of vector or anything is good. <laughs> I had a, a client one time, um, this is way, way back, and they were a client. I was moving them to a Magento site and um, they they were like, OK, this is cool, but how do I access the, the customer's credit card number? This is like, what do you mean? How do you access the customer's credit card number? They're like, well, typically we we would then write down their credit card number on this pad and then we would type it into our thing here. And then that would yeah. chart. I'm like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, I, you don't want you. You should not have their credit card number. Right. That is for someone else to not even have, but to keep an authorization uh, token for like you should have the customer ID. And that's that's pretty much it. If you want to charge them, it should be through the app or whatever. But oh, boy. Yeah. I'm surprised, at least in Canada, how often that still happens. Oh, yeah. Like we got no new doors for our house or you need to pay a bill for the propane or anything like that. And all the time, I'm literally just standing there telling them every number on the card as well yeah. as my home address. <laughs> and like, I'm like, you could literally just go type this into the like any website and go buy all you want. Like, how is this still how it works. It seems so silly. <laughs> I love uh, uh, that Square became a thing and like going to service providers or like, you know, the AC guy comes out, fixes it. You just tap your phone on his little Square thing attached to his phone. Bingo, bango. That's it. Oh, I've never had that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had that a few times and it's just every single time you're very thankful for it. You're not cutting out a check. You're not having to, you know, do any of that stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I'm here for those modern tools. Uh, one of those modern tools 
is going to be Sentry, which is a <laughs> this is this is I don't know if that that ad transition worked, but Sentry is a <laughs> error and exception handling tool, and it's exceedingly modern, and it will tell you if your website is slow. I mean, let's a little callback to that uh, that question about all that JavaScript loading. You got too much JavaScript loading. This will tell you if this website is slow because you got too much JavaScript, and it does that through this really great performance tracking metrics table that gives you a user misery score, tells you which sites or which pages on your site and your application are being hit which are the slowest and which of them have the most opportunity for you to tweak that and figure out what you can do to stop making your website so slow. So if you want to add that in addition to all of the error and exception handling tools that Sentry is known for, head on over to Sentry.io, use the coupon code Tasty Treat, all lowercase, all one word, and you'll get two months for free. Thank you so much for Sentry for sponsoring. All right, next question here is from Aaron from Fort Collins, Colorado. Hey, uh, Fort Collins is pretty dope, by the way, Wes. They have a nice little beer scene. It's like a small college town. I think it's Colorado State University is over there. Ooh. Pretty cute little city uh, in Colorado there. If you want to do a brewery tour, that's one of the places to go. Odell, shout out. I am about to start my first developer job. What practices can I start to really get off on the right foot and lay down a foundation for a successful career. I'd love an entire episode that I could reference back to my first year. So we did just do kind of an episode about stuff for beginners. And I think that one will probably fit a lot of the things that you're looking for here. But let's say you're starting your first developer job. That means you got the job. That means you at least uh, are not a brand new developer here. What practices can I start to get off on the right foot and lay down a foundation? You know, the one of the single best things you can do besides being a sponge for the things that your coworkers are talking about is just to be helpful at work. Um, somebody needs something, you know, step up and do it. Be the person that everybody's like, oh, hey, I really like Aaron. He, uh. He did this for me. He did X for me. He uh, helped me out here or did that. You know, I was, you know, just doing kind things for people and being the type of coworker that you'd like other people to say, you know, that that that's a really good person right there. He's doing some good work. I'm really excited he's on this team. And, and don't try to do too much arguing or keep in mind, this is like things that I've experienced before. Somebody new on the team, they're a junior developer. They want to start critiquing things or, or calling the shots or something like that. Not your role. You're there to to show up, to be a sponge, to listen, to do what they ask of you and be a good worker bee for a little bit. You know, and that doesn't mean you can't like assert some of your, your stuff later on if you have things. But like, man, there's nothing worse than having a project that's like 50 percent of the way through. Some new guy comes along and they're just like, it'd be really great as X, Y and Z technology in this thing. We should really add that. Like, no, we are beyond this point. It is not your 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 work. Let's let's keep going with how these things are. And uh, maybe later you can share us some of your your brilliant new things as a new developer. Yeah, I, I think Scott said it really well. Just be hungry to learn, ask lots of questions, respect the older developers that have been there for a little longer. Like no one likes that that new dev that comes in and tries to change everything. So just having an open mind and learning from what you have, I think is the best way you can start yourself up for a successful career. Maybe we'll do, we just did an entire episode on advice for new developers. So yeah. you can also go back to that one as well. There's lots of really good info there. You should also think about like, you know, a lot of the times you won't have context for conversations that have happened before you're there or whatever. So many times people come in, if they are, they are suggesting new things or whatever, it might not just be because the previous people haven't thought about them. It might be because you're missing some key context to why, <laughs> you know, why, why they made the choices they did about a specific project. Either way, it all comes back to, uh, don't be an O-doll, just, um, come in, be hungry to learn. Next question from Mark Froelich, obligatory. You guys are awesome statement here. Thank you, Mark Froelich. Have you ever used your dev schools to trade for other goods or services? For instance, helping out an auto mechanic with their website in exchange for a brake service on your car or creating a site for a barbershop for free haircuts for a year? If so, how do you go about starting that conversation? So this is kind of interesting one. Do you barter your skills? And I always think this bartering is is a little bit funny because I was I used to be part of these um, buds groups on Facebook where you could only trade stuff. Is that like a marijuana group, Buds? Uh, no, it's it does sound <laughs> like that. No, but it's a uh, basically someone would be like, uh, I have this chair or this hoodie or something that I want to trade. And then uh, what do you have to trade for? Like I am looking to trade this hoodie size medium 
for, uh, I don't know, a loaf of bread or something like that. And what would <laughs> always end up happening over the, the one year that I was in it, everything standardized on bottles of wine or bottles of beer. And I was just sitting there laughing because it's mostly full of hippies who like love this idea of trading. I was like, you, you guys are just standardizing on a currency of wine. Like the, the wine is like $12 <laughs> a bottle here. And you people would say, we'll trade for four bottles of wine. You know, like they're just like, I'm like, that's what money is. We've standardized on this. this that's what money is. <laughs> anyway, How about you give me money and I go buy the wine. Or, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Exactly. And then like, then people I get would the trade. exact bottles I want. Exactly. Like, what are the chances that somebody has exactly what you're looking for? We've already solved this problem in society. Anyways, I think that bartering can be a little bit frustrating um, versus the money, but I have done it. Our backyard, we got this really nice uh, slate patio installed and I traded it. I think I did a a $4,000 website and they did like a $13,000 job. And what we did is we just, we both quoted what our things would be. And then we just took that off. So I did the website and they took four grand off the, the final bill. And that was nice and clean cut because there was no like, oh, you did this for me. And, and, and like, what happens if one person doesn't deliver? Do you go in there? Like, how do you get your haircuts if the thing isn't done? So I would say stay away from it. But there certainly is like little good use cases for that. I've even... I think the smaller stuff is probably better than a, a massive website project. But like, I remember once when Craigslist was still a thing in Canada, like people would always like look up your email when, or like I had westboss.com and somebody was selling like a fireplace mantle for a hundred bucks. And they said, Hey, I'll give this to you for free. If you can just fix this thing on my website. And it was like a <laughs> tiny little 20 minute fix. I was like, absolutely. Let's do it. So I think small stuff can be good. But probably as it gets bigger, money is a nice common denominator. Yeah, totally. How many how many bottles of wine would this take for, for me to fix this <laughs> bug for you? We get uh, five bottles of wine. I'll fix this bug. That'd be great. Next question is from Jiffy Park. Jiffy Park says, what is your take on DRM? DRM stands for, ooh, what does that stand for, Wes? It stands for Digital Rights Management. Rights Management. Okay, there we go. Have you implemented or integrated something like why divine in any of your platform projects? How does one go about DL DCing such a thing? I can't seem to find any good docs on that. I personally can relate as to why it's there, but end up hating it anyways. I recently found out that Prime Video only allows SD content on Linux because something to do with Widevine DRM they employ. I got outraged and eventually canceled my subscription. Uh, thank you. Oh, and by the way. All of my names are related to Seinfeld in some way. Stella is a reference to when Elaine gets high on pain medication. Stella. Oh, oh yeah. Is Jiffy Park where they parked where they couldn't find their car? I don't remember. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> that was uh, like awesome. Okay. Well, I love, I, love, I love a good Seinfeld episode. So Widevine, I've never heard of this Widevine. I typed it into Google. It says the leading content protection for media enables secure content protection utilizing a free standard-based solutions for OTT and CAS services. I don't know what those are, but it sounds interesting. Um, it's used by Disney, Warner Brothers, Netflix, Hulu, a lot of people. So the nature of DRM, is an interesting conversation. And you often have people who are very polarized on this topic. They're saying, you know, DRM is the uh, devil. It's not digital rights management. I was trying to come up with another spelling of the acronym, devil rendering my stuff. So <laughs> yeah, the DRM situation is really pretty crystal clear in my eyes. If you have major studios who own this IP, major content providers, they are not going to put their content somewhere where you can just take it they will not do that. It costs too much money for them to produce this stuff. So digital rights management will always be here. It's not something that is ever going to uh, be burnt at the stake. Um, and the people who are, you know, want, want all content and media to be free. Well, I understand your position. It's it's not realistic. It's never going to happen. Yeah. So we might as well just figure out how to live with DRM. Now, that thing about Linux, uh, that was interesting. You know, I've had a lot of little experiences on Linux like that where things just weren't the same as they were on Mac and PC, which is one of the reasons why I don't write it as my full time. And that stinks that the, this wide find doesn't work on Linux, given that however many of these services use it, it looks like just about everybody. So what, what are my thoughts on it? 
I think it's a um, required evil, so to say, but, uh, you know, evil in the sense that it sucks when they'll only serve out SD video because of something in Linux that you have no control over. And that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. Digital, right, d DRM should not be invasive. I understand its need to exist, but when people are implementing this kind of stuff, they do have to look at it and say, is this ruining my product? And if it is ruining my product and its product experience, maybe we should look at another way of doing it. I know video games is like a hot topic because there's some video games that need to always connect to the Internet. I think that's a terrible, terrible thing yeah. because I don't want, you know, my non Wi-Fi connected game to require me to connect to the Internet so I can I can't play it on the airplane or something. You know, that that stinks. But at the same regard, you got to have something. You can't make your product worse because of DRM. And that is often the case. Like. I'll give you an example is the Paw Patrol on Netflix. When <laughs> we Patrol. go to, we have it on Canadian Netflix. And then when you come to our cottage, we have American internet because of some ways that I get internet and it's like gone. And then our kids are like, like, where is it? And I'm like, oh, no. like, come on, you know, like you're getting in, in. And that's more, I guess, like that's not really DRM. That's just more content licensing and things like that. But and I'm just like, oh, now I, that, now I have to download it for my kids because I'm paying my money for this. But because of whatever's going on or I can't. Uh, another annoying one is on the Netflix app, the videos expire. So what happens is that we'll download all these these um, videos onto the iPad from Netflix and we'll go on a trip. And then two weeks later, we'll go on another trip and we'll, the kids will open up the iPad in the car and then we'll say these things are expired. I'm like, come on, like now the kids can't watch a show in the car. You know, that sort of DRM is is frustrating to me because I'm just trying to do the right thing and and pay the money for the for the service and whatnot. And it gets in the way, and makes the product worse. Totally. I had the same situation trying to I, YouTube TV has like the ability to download content, right, to watch offline. Yeah, I download the content to watch offline on my airplane. Uh, and I got on the airplane and I opened up the YouTube app and it's like, we noticed you're not in Denver, Colorado anymore. You can't open this app. Oh, <laughs> yes. I forgot to download the content. I had it all downloaded. What are you, what are you talking about? We don't support YouTube <laughs> TV in the country that you're in, but I downloaded the content. Let me access it, man. Just let me get in there. I'm not trying to watch live TV. So that was that was super obnoxious. But yeah, that's my that's my take on DRM. Pretty long winded. Cool. Well, if you want to keep your authentication secure, perhaps you should be looking into using a service like Auth0. Wes, do you want to talk about Auth0? Yes, I do. They are a brand new sponsor. So shout out to Auth0 for coming on the podcast and sponsoring it. Uh, what they do is they provide the authentication and authorization for your application so you don't have to. So some of the things that they do is they have login with your favorite social provider. So if you ever have tried to implement login with Twitter, Google, Discord, you can tell that that's a big pain in the butt to, to do. They do it all for you. You can make a customizable login page with them. They have SDKs for all of your favorite frameworks. So you're building a Node or Express app, React, Next.js, and you name it. They've got integrations for it. They have next level features, user management, including roles and permissions, multi-factor authentication. So we've talked about, we've done a, po a couple podcasts on roles and permissions, and we always end up saying, this is very hard to do. And if you want a nice interface, nice service to manage all of your roles and permissions, Auth0 is a one. And they also do, this is kind of a, a new one. I kind of want to do a podcast on this is biometrics, being able to use Face ID or Touch ID or all these different sensors that are on your devices to log in. And you can just integrate that with Auth0. They do all the hard stuff because I have a card to do a show on biometrics because it's in WebKit now. And it is very complicated to, to implement yourself. So check it out at a0.to forward slash syntax. That is oh, wow. a very a two letter domain name. That's a cool, cool domain. Impressive. A0.to forward slash syntax and sign up. Thank you, Auth0, for sponsoring. Yeah, totally. Cool. Well, uh, next question here is from George Hart. Have you seen the Framework laptop? And if so, what are your thoughts on it for web development? I'm a lifelong Mac user, but the idea of a higher repairable laptop running Linux 
Uh, can't do Windows. That sounds like an amazing step for for consumers. Wes, have you seen this? Because I only it only recently came across my radar last week, and um, it seems like this and people are starting to talk about it. No, I'm not. So what's what's the idea behind this? <laughs> the idea behind it is it's a little bit more of a DIY high end laptop, and it looks a lot like you know the MacBook Pro type of thing. But there's there's the idea that everything is replaceable, upgradable, that type of deal. You have little components you can screw in and whether or not it is the, you know, SSD strip, you can, you can upgrade it in a more easy, simple way than any other thing. And the top, top case just kind of pops off and you can upgrade it and and change it out yourself. You know what? This thing looks great, but this kind of idea, especially with laptops is going to be really hard to succeed. I think I know in the past we, we were able to swap out Ram and and stuff like that, but computers have so much more soldered to the board now. And and I know that's like an Apple problem that they largely created themselves, but you know what? I don't know if I'd trust this thing, especially if it's brand new here. I think there's going to be a lot of bugs. They got to work out with the system. I wonder how long term this thing will last. And since it is a new company, a new laptop, you just never know. But also, you know, I I personally ran Linux for a little bit. And if you're coming from Mac, it's not easy to have it be as easy as Mac. There's still a lot of like weird things, especially around graphics. Um, Just things feel unfinished in a lot of ways. The trackpad support was largely the trackpads all felt weird to me in terms of the the physics of them. Yeah. So there's like a lot of little things like that. If you're coming from Mac, it's not going to feel like a Mac. Just be prepared that it's going to feel a little bit less put together so to say so i don't know this laptop looks looks neat but i would i would give it some time personally before for diving in on this thing yeah they tried this with a phone where you could like click on different yeah. pieces and that thing never took off there, there's a reason why these things are soldered together and maybe it is because apple wants to you to, to pay for everything but part of it is that if every little wire and piece of silicon that stuff needs to transfer through that slows it down right so it, having them soldered together and on the same, even on the same chip makes it much faster. So that's one. And the other is like, I don't want to use Windows. And the final thing for me is that like, I open everything. I, I, I just opened up two of my iPhones and replaced batteries and screens. And I will crack anything open and try to fix literally anything I am. That, like, that is my personality. And there's one thing I will not crack open myself. And that is my work laptop. Yeah. My money maker. I don't care that I have to go to Apple and talk to the geniuses and, and whatnot because I, my money maker needs to work. It needs to be fast as hell. And I don't necessarily care anything else other than that because that, I can't be down on that. So uh, it does not appeal to me as a content creator. Word. I agree. Next question from Tomek Rosalski. Hey, guys, I know you both like MongoDB and so do I, but I sometimes all these queries to databases, especially aggregations, get really messy, aren't they? Prisma now has support for MongoDB. What do you think? Will it make be requesting MongoDB much easier? Yeah, so I don't necessarily know if this is an issue just with MongoDB, but if you want to make aggregations in MongoDB, so that is like select... 6,000 people and for each one count how many courses they have and then for each course sum up how much they have watched on each one. That would be extremely slow to query in JavaScript or PHP and then loop over and do all that. So often what you have to do is you have to send that query to MongoDB and do the query in the database and then it will return to you the modified data. It's way faster. Like like 50, 100 times faster to do it on the database. But writing those aggregations is pretty tricky because it's like it's a language that we're not familiar with. And I have a whole little snippet file of different aggregations that I often have to do. So I think the aggregations like SQL, I don't think is any better than that. You have all these inner joins and all that. That stuff can get really, really tricky as well. Prisma has support for MongoDB, which is really exciting because Prisma is a framework that you can just write Prisma queries and then it will do the translation to MongoDB, which is really exciting. Will it make requesting MongoDB much easier? I think so. And then they also do a lot of stuff under the hood that takes care of like the N plus one problem. We've talked about that in the past. I don't know if Prisma does any aggregation stuff though. So still, if you're trying to loop over 100,000 people and count how many courses they have, then you probably still will have to go straight to 
straight to the DB and write your own aggregations. Yeah, this is definitely one thing that um, like migrations have been kind of a pain as as our site has grown over the years. I mean, it's 20. We started it in 2015 with the current database we're in. And there has been several times when I'm like, you know what? I really not that I wish I would have done this in something other than Mongo for performance or whatever reasons. But there are times when I think, man, I feel like the database would be better organized right now if it were in Postgres from the start. Yeah, because they force you to do migrations and things like that rather than just kind of willy nilly adding onto the DB. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a database administrator and this n- never been, you know, if we were listing out my top skills, it's never been at the top of that ladder. Right. So I think using something a bit more strict would have saved me from myself earlier on in the development of this thing. And I'd be a lot happier. We're, we're making a lot of those changes now, but I think it, it would have made our database a lot more reliable or stronger in terms of knowing that the data that we're asking for is always going to be there in the specific ways. So I would love any tool that would make that better for MongoDB. We use Mongoose, but it still doesn't necessarily help with things like migration, so to say. Yeah. It can, you know, make your scheme and things like that. So if this Prisma can really at least make the experience of working with Mongo a little bit more solid, then I would do that. Again, I, I largely understand that many of the the reasons why it's it, ours has, you know, had some cruft to it added over the years is, is 100% my fault. But in the same regard, yeah, I, I think I would love to have the database layer be a little bit more solid for me, at least nowadays. Yeah, Prisma is shaping up to be really, really nice with all the the migrations they have built in, multiple database adapters. GraphQL obviously is a big one. So I would definitely, if I was building my thing from scratch, I would probably go for Prisma. I think so. Keystone itself is now using Prisma as well, which is exciting. I have never written any Prisma, and I, I think I would really like it. I used GraphQL back in the day, but I have not used Prisma. All right, next question is from Ben Lammers. Ben, um, he says, hey, guys, been diving into Svelte a bit and recently, and I had a question about using it with GraphQL. As I recall, Scott once deemed React TypeScript GraphQL Cogen as the promised land, and <laughs> since then I've tried it out and found it to be awesome. However, I've been debating moving a larger personal project from React to Svelte. I see that there is a plugin for a GraphQL code gen Svelte Apollo, but with my limited knowledge of Svelte, I find it hard to decipher and if the development experience would be as streamlined. I'm wondering if you could shed some light on the developer experience and working the GraphQL and Svelte in TypeScript. So Ben, this is what we do. We have our, our whole thing being set up through GraphQL code gen, and we do use Apollo, although you know, only using Apollo because that's what we used before. And I don't want to rewrite that aspect of things because I think the way that you'll see GraphQL being done in Svelte might be a little bit different with Svelte Kit. And personally, we've even moved away from using the Apollo cache, not necessarily at all, but mostly and just doing the entire caching data layer in Svelte. And it has been very easy. Now, in terms of the difference between how Streamlined is the code gen experience in React versus Svelte, Believe it or not, the Svelte version of it is actually way easier, way better, especially for Svelte Kit for this type of thing. Because with the React version, what you're doing is it's spitting out a hook typically. And so what you do is, let's say you have a hook that is update user. So it spits out a you or you have a, a GraphQL query that's update user. It spits you out a hook, use update user. Then you, in your code, you say const <laughs> update user is equal to use update user, right? <laughs> Just that kind of like annoying flow where you're importing a thing and then calling another thing to use the thing. But in Svelte, you, you just have a function. So the import is just update user. You import update user from the generated code and you just use it like a function. So it's one less step of having to write the hook that then creates the function for you. Yeah. And to me, it makes me realize just how obnoxious that is in React because you think, oh, that's just like a little thing. And hooks are really nice to be able to share that kind of functionality. But it's like, wait, why can't I just import a function? <laughs> why can't I just import and use a function? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is what, what it does in SvelteKit. So, um, you know, personally, we've gotten away from the the Apollo cache side of things, which is somebody who recommended that approach to us on the the Svelte Discord, and I've been largely happy with it because you can update the Svelte stores yourself. One neat thing, too, is that with this code gen, with this GraphQL code gen for Svelte, it gives you the Apollo one, that is. It gives you a, an async version of the function if you want it, or it gives you one that returns an observable. So that means if you wanted to tap into Svelte's subscription syntax, 
you can do that and have the data available client side via an observable. Or if you wanted it server side and you want that data server side, you can call it in a load function using the async one, which just returns a promise with the data. And you know what, to be honest, it's been very nice because if we have the data that's coming in from the server side of things, we're not having to worry about loading screens or any of that stuff like we were in the React space where, I mean, obviously we weren't using Next.js there, but you know, we're not having to worry about calling a hook, waiting for that data, maybe showing a loading screen for that stuff. We're doing it all server side via the load function. So this is what we use. The, the GraphQL code gen Svelte Apollo has been really nice for us. That's amazing that some of these problems just aren't problems and you don't need solutions for them in Svelte at all. I think the biggest problem for Svelte when we were first getting going was making problems where there were none because we're so <laughs> used to the React way of things where you kind of have to like do, you kind of have to do a roundabout way to do just about everything, right? And then so we'd say, what's the right way to do this? Oh, the right way to do this is to just update the variable. Oh, oh wait, why was I trying to make this so hard? You know, there's like little things like that where it's almost like, you have to simplify your brain a little bit because of how easier some things are. Great answer. Next question we have here is from Chris. Have you had, do y'all have any thoughts about Frontity for WordPress? Frontity.org. I swear I'm not a plant for Frontity, but I stumbled upon it. I'm trying to evaluate it versus other solutions like Next.js to use a headless WordPress setup. I would love your thoughts if you have anything. So I have not checked this out, but this looks like what a lot of people have been waiting for to do. React and WordPress, because the thing about doing a WordPress web powered website, but doing the entire front end in another thing is that you give up so much that WordPress gives you for free. You give up the commenting and all of the templating niceties that they give you with classes and uh, header and footer. You give that all up and you have to rebuild all of that from scratch. And you also have to write all of your queries and, and things like that. So I think that's been a reason why a lot of people have not gone for headless WordPress is just because it's it's so much more work for really mm -hmm. any more benefit, like maybe sometimes, but sometimes not. So this looks pretty cool if you check it out at frontity.org. And it seems to be, it uses React, but it's for WordPress. And they're saying like, why not use something like Gatsby or Next.js? And they say, Frontity is 100% focused on WordPress. It means the number of concepts you need to learn are minimal, doesn't require complex configuration to get started. The API is what developers use to request content. They have their own state manager, their own CSS and JS solution. Uh, you don't have to learn other things. I think that's what a lot of WordPress people want. It's like, just give me this thing that's wrapped up. I can learn a few new things here or there, but I still need like a little bit more batteries included than like a lower level Gatsby or Next, which is funny to think of them as lower level, but it is when you get into WordPress land. So I think this is pretty cool. It's Frontity is also HTML rendered on the server, which is pretty exciting as well. So there's not a whole lot that will be done on the client. So I haven't checked it out myself, but it looks very promising. I would love to hear from anybody who has built a website in it to see what they uh, they think themselves. Yeah. This is the type of thing I would love to see more. I I never heard of this. And honestly, I have a hard time saying it. Frontity. Frontity. I have a hard time saying that word for some reason. But it seems neat. I'll check it out. I'll, I'll definitely give it a try. And Chris, I do not believe that you are not a plant. I strongly believe your name is Chris Frontity. And you have done this to get us to talk about Frontity on the show. But no, I think it's really neat. Um, down for more stuff like this. V very neat. All right. Next question here is from The Dom. The Dom asks... Call me weird. You are weird, the Dom. But I kind of like fiddling around with the Webpack configs. I just like that level sicko. of control I have. Yeah, sicko. Uh, that being said, is Webpack going to die now that better tools are out there? Or do you think that we might see a Webpack 6 with ES build under the hood that makes it compete with Parcel Vite Snowpack in terms of speed? Uh, you know what? They're going to have to do something because... The problem with the Webpack is that it is everywhere. Everybody everybody bought into the Webpack train, but now all these new tools are so much faster, like hundreds of times faster. And, and people often talk about benchmarks, but let me tell you, I cannot go back to slow tools after using ES Build, <laughs> yeah. Vite, or any of that stuff. It is that much better. It is one of the single best developer experience changes that I've had in a very long time. So those things have config files. If you like writing config files, hey, go to town on the uh, Vite's config file. Go go to town on it or ES build. There's tons of config there if you want. 
Um, if you don't want to, you can also use the tools with list config because it's really nice to not have to worry about that type of config if you don't want to. So if it's a config thing you're worried about control, man, these tools all have lots of control. But if, if Webpack was not thinking about the fact that they're, you know, going to be on the slow end of speed of all these new tools, they better start thinking about that because I, I don't want to work on anything with a Webpack after working on something with Vite personally. And that's just my, you know, my personal experience with it. But that said, I was never, I never bought into the Webpack train in the first place. I mean, it, it is fantastic and it does great things, but I always had a hard time with the nature of their, their config files and sort of the nature of um, configuring Webpack feeling like you need a degree to do it, right? It's never been my style of tool. What do you think, Wes? Yeah, I think we'll we'll have to see what things like Create React App and Next.js and Gatsby, we'll see what they do in terms of like using it because I think Webpack might just move towards being more of a under the hood tool and then it already is in Gatsby and Next.js, right? So uh, it might just do that. We'll see. I I don't really know. I'm not going to predict any of these things, but I do know that I'm very happy that we are in a spot now where these... There's many options and lots of them are very fast and they're all competing with each other. And it's it's a good life now. And it used to be very, very tricky. So I'm very happy that we haven't written Webpack configs in a while. Yeah, me too. And no, thank you. Cool. Well, that is the potluck in the last episode of Syntax in my career office. I'm so I'm going to be so sad. I don't know if you get this, Wes, but I get really sad to leave places like even like my apartments. When I leave an apartment and you move all your stuff out and you're just standing in your apartment being like, oh, the great times I had in this apartment, <laughs> you know, that that's me. I, I get real teared up. So I'm going to be very sad to leave this office, but looking forward to the future here. So before we get into sick picks here, we have one more sponsor, and that is Linode. Wes, do you want to talk about Linode? I do. I'm going to start it off with saying Linode's going to give you a hundred bucks. Woo. That's my hook Woo. to get you to listen to this ad read. So Linode is a cloud computing hosting service. They give you, you probably know them for hosting a Linux server, but they have so much more than that. They have storage for your images and your your videos. They have uh, GPUs you can use. They have bare metal, Kubernetes, dedicated CPU, cloud firewalls, all that good stuff. So you want to host your next project. That's a very basic using their shared Linux servers. Linode's going to give you a hundred bucks of free credit to try it off on your next project. So check it out. Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com forward slash syntax. Thank you, Linode, for sponsoring. And thanks for the hundred bucks for everybody who's going to use it. Yeah. Cool. Well, now is the part of the show where we talk about things that are sick, our sick picks, picks that we find to be sick. And I'm going to I'm going to start this off with a little bit of app that you might want, Wes. This is going to be something that I've been utilizing for a couple of weeks now. My laptop, <laughs> which is a 16 inch MacBook Pro, the throttling on the CPU is so bad that when the temperature gets hot, it, it can crap out my audio. It can do all sorts of really bad stuff. Frame rate will just drop. I had to re-record several of my tutorial videos because the um, the CPU was being throttled so hard that the recording software wasn't functioning correctly. So I got an app. It's called Hot H O T, and it tells you exactly how much your CPU is being throttled along with the temperature. So at any given point, it'll say your CPU is you know 170 degrees Fahrenheit right now. And it is running at 86% capacity. That way, you know, or I know visually that if it's getting dipping down there, that I should be expecting like a major slowdown. It also helps me understand a little bit about like, maybe like if VS Code isn't being as performant or my computer is just feeling sloggy or just not good, I can see it if it is the CPU that is being actually throttled here or if it is that I have too much stuff going on because that can certainly be a thing. Are you running too many processes or are, is your computer itself throttling itself? So hot is the app. I will post a link to uh, this app in the show notes. It's free. It's free little utility here. So check it out. I'm going to sick pick the silicone mat. This is something that I bought for our dog's bowl. So uh, we have our dog's water bowl on a hardwood floor oh, yeah. and every now and then it spills because you're bending over to give them the water and it spills over the side and you have to go get a cloth and you don't want the hardwood to be ruined. So we bought this little silicone mat to go under the bowls and it's got a little lip on it. It wipes off easily and they have a couple different sizes. And I was like, man, this is, it's nice and neat. Uh, it just sort of stays in the corner under the bowls 
And I was thinking like, oh, what else could you use this for? Like if you were doing even like some electronics work, you could put everything on there. It's silicone. So like, or even like some soldering work. So is it like anti-static there? I don't know if it's anti-static, but like silicone has a super high melting temp. So I would imagine it would work well for putting a soldering iron down and not having to worry about that. So I'm wondering if I should get one. There probably are, I don't probably don't have to buy a dog mat for that to work. There's probably specific <laughs> ones for soldering, but I was very happy with it. I was like, this is a nice little uh, thing to save your floor. So check it out. Silicone waterproof pet food and water bowl mat. Also works for cats. Not a bowl mat. More cats. Cool. Well, uh, shameless plugs here. Uh, the latest course on Level Up Tutorials, by the time you are listening to this, is my new course on Web Components. Now, I did a deep dive in Web Components 101, and we talk about writing Web Components. And, and this is straight up JavaScript and HTML. In fact, the only thing that we're using from NPM or anything like that is using npx serve just to serve up an HTML file. We write all the JavaScript inline in HTML, and we do so for to show you that this is 101 foundational web components skills here. If you have no experience here with web components whatsoever, this is the course for you. We will tell you everything you need to know, and by the end of it, you'll have a couple component, a couple of components that are configurable, work really well, and should get you far enough where you can at least start tweaking and writing your own web components. So if this sounds interesting to you, head on over to leveluptutorials.com forward slash pro, sign up for the year and save 25% or sign up for your team and get everybody on board saving 25% there. So check it out, leveluptutorials.com. I'm going to shamelessly plug all my courses. So I make web development courses to teach you JavaScript, CSS, HTML, Node, you name it, westboss.com forward slash courses. You can use the coupon code syntax for 10 bucks off. Uh, you can use it on any of them. There's also a whole bunch of free ones there if you want to try it out and see if you like the way that I teach. Uh, there's a bunch of free ones on there on CSS Grid or Flexbox, or I even have one on Markdown. So check it out. Uh, I was going to say thanks to me for sponsoring, but that is my shameless <laughs> plug. I've done that before. Thank you for uh, Level Up Tutorials for, I guess, sponsoring this this podcast as well. <laughs> cool. Well, um, it's been really great, Wes. It was a great potluck. And uh, we will catch you after our vacay wraps up. And we're going to be feeling fresh and recharged with a whole bunch of new new stuff here. And maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll have some new bumpers for the show. I, I'm laughing while I'm saying this because I think we've... We've claimed that we'll have new bumpers or, or new things le, le, uh, a few times now <laughs> and have never done it. So I'm just saying that is because I don't I don't necessarily have any plans to change them. But who knows? Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. I'll keep you on your toes. All right. Peace. Peace. Head on over to syntax.fm for a full archive of all of our shows. And don't forget to subscribe in your podcast player or drop a review if you like this show.